So we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I started the meeting by saying thank you all very much uh, for showing up and being a part of the ongoing conversation. Um, we're just gonna go ahead and jump right into our agenda uh, to keep us moving. First, we're gonna have an introduction of our, our new committee members, followed by public comment, then we have a discussion for a number of items. Does everyone in the public have a copy of the agenda? Yes? Okay, that'll help us keep moving in an organized fashion. Thank you. All right. So we have expanded our committee since the last time we've met. We've added members of the community that were appointed by both our former and, and our current mayor. And really excited to, to you know, get into this phase of the work. So if we can go ahead and start, and we'll start with Ms. Bonnie Lockhart. If you could just share with the members Public a little bit about maybe past volunteer roles, <laughs> and then I know that could take some time. For you. <laughs> and then really, you know, why you're here, and what you hope to contribute to the mm. committee. Thank you. It's quite a bit to talk about. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bonnie Lockhart, and um, I am a lifelong Evastonian, um, third generation, as they would say. Evastonian, and uh, I have been a community activist for about 30 years, um, starting out uh, running for alderman back in 1997 and uh, running for school board and actually securing a position on the school board, as well as working with CETA, the History Committee, um, and the Commission on Aging. I'm currently a member of the uh, Dementia Friendly Evanston, and I am a registered nurse uh, working for the Mather of Evanston. I am here for many reasons, but mostly because I'm very excited about the opportunity to uh, provide this program to our residents of Evanston and to uh, bring information to the community. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Claire Barber. I, I have to admit, first off, that I'm not a lifelong Evanstonian. <laughs> my family, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and my family moved to Evanston in 2012. I'm an attorney um, by profession, and I specialize in estate planning. And with that specialty brought a side interest in looking at the wealth gap. I also um, started a free legal clinic that has legal and social services for seniors called Elder Law and Wellness. And again, in running the clinic, I saw this issue of the wealth gap coming up um, over and over again. And looking into that, I could see the, with the breakdown, I saw there was a distinct, with the, with the racial disparity, <clears throat> excuse me. I could see a distinct link to many of the programs that our community, uh, that are, that nationally uh, had been uh, excluded from. So looking at inherited wealth on both sides, what percentage comes down to the present day, and looking at programs that we have been excluded from all the way back to the Homestead Act, different programs after World War I, World War II that we specifically were excluded from, and how that relates to the wealth gap today in very concrete terms. So I was very happy to have the opportunity when I, I, I was so proud to be living in Evanston when this uh, program uh, uh, came up and was uh, really honored to have my application to be a committee member accepted, particularly as I am not a lifelong Evanstonian, so I felt very, very honored to be able to sit here with all of you and hopefully to channel some of these things that I have done um, in my profession and just as an interest into something that's concrete and useful and to assist in some of the discussions and uh, to participate in throwing around uh, different uh, ideas and expertise about how we can concretely begin to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Mr. Carl, Carl Sutton. 
first? No, no, no. She'll be save the best for last. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> <not painful. laughs> because Mr. Mr. Sutton is, is, is the best. Well, He's the elder. Mm -hmm. Thank you for choosing such uh, beautiful women. <laughs> women, plural, right? Yeah, that's what he Watch said. yourself, women. That's what he said. Um, good morning, everyone. My good name morning. is Robin Rue Simmons, and I am the most recent uh, past retired alderman uh, of the Fifth Ward here in Evanston. And I am very excited to have been appointed by the mayor to serve on this committee to continue doing the work that we started on the 80th City Council. Hey, Mr. Carl Sutton. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people out here this morning. Thank you, Peter and the uh, city of Evanston for this opportunity. Uh, being a third generation Evanstonian and an active member in the community, retired from District 65 and also taught at 202, I've had a chance to realize that Evanston now stands at the brink of history. We're in a very good position now to set the tone which I hope the nation will pick up the ball and follow. We are under the eyes now of the whole world. It's just easy for me to say that, but I have received emails and calls from California, Oregon, New York, all over the country. Brother, get it right, okay? Because what you're doing here in Evanston <clears throat> will be the boilerplate for communities throughout this country and uh, respectively, we hope that the, finally the Congress will play, uh, pass the restoration uh, uh, bill. But uh, my main concern here is that we have many inadequacies in this city that gives us an opportunity to address the wrong that has been done to members in this community. I think it's long overdue, and I look forward to doing everything I can to justify that and to make sure everyone is taken care of who's in need. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sutton, for your eloquent words. Uh, before we get started with our public comment, I just want to acknowledge two members uh, that are in our, our public in our presence. Uh, Mr. Dino Robinson, can you please stand, sir? Just one of our Evanston residents, uh, our local historian, uh, the executive director of uh, Shorefront. Uh, you've been so instrumental in helping us to get to this point. I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge you again for all your research that have provided the platform for this work. So thank you very much. I also want to recognize uh, Mr. Cam Howard uh, within COBRA. Please stand, sir. We want to thank you so much, a national organization, extremely instrumental in helping us to provide the framework for the work that we're doing. So thank you so much for joining us this evening as well. All right, uh, next we have I want to quickly introduce our staff uh, who have worked very tirelessly to get here. Um, Mr. Nicholas Cumming, our, our new corporation counsel, thank you very much. I don't know if you just want to share a brief summary of your work and, and who you are, and then we'll just keep going down the line. Good morning, uh, everyone. Chair Braithwaite, members of the committee, Nicholas Cummings Corporation Council. Um, my job for the committee is to make sure that the work, that the ideas that are developed here actually uh, are constitutional and make sure that we can actually uh, if, withstand any sort of challenge uh, from those that don't like progress in the courts. Um, although I may not be the one defending it, uh, my job is to advise you. Uh, so keep that in mind if you have questions. Uh, my department is here for you, but I feel like this work is so important that I need to be here myself. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sheikher, our new assistant to the city manager. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, so I'm Tashi Kerr, as um, Council Member Berthoid said. I am the assistant to the city manager, and I, Kimberly and Nick, just one of the staff liaison serving the committee. So welcome um, to the new, new members. Thank you. So for those of you in the public, if you have not taken an opportunity to look at our, our website, so you go to the city of Evanston, you can search reparations. I just want to thank you so much to Sheik for all your hard work. She, she often does so much behind the scenes, and it's important for people to recognize how hard you work. So we're, we're in an instant, excuse me, because of time, we, we haven't been able, we won't be able to get into the history 
and I hope throughout our meetings we'll be able to touch on how we got there. But if you are unclear in terms of the, the efforts that have taken place over the past two years to get us to this point, it is all very well laid out on our, on our reparations website, and a lot of that has to do with the work that Tashik has uh, provided. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Kimberly Richardson, our Deputy City, City Manager. Good morning, committee, chair, and community for being here today. Um, my role as the as staff liaison is to support the policy making, take the collective conversations, and try to make the committee uh, be able to realize their, uh, their vision. And so our job is really to support the committee's role in doing that vision thinking, as well as putting the plans um, in place. So we will talk more about that this morning, about how we've, as staff, been supporting that behind the scenes. Um, but we're here to help and support the community. If you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself or to Sheik. We are here to answer any questions. There's no small question. And we're here to support the committee as best we can. So thank you very much for this opportunity. All right. So much of the work that within our local government is performed by over 800 city staff. Kimberly, I just want to thank you so much. You've been here since the concept of this, and you've worked with us all the way through this point. So thank you very much. All right. Next, we have uh, public comment. Uh, we have one, two, three members of the committee that have signed up. Is there anyone else that is signed up or that is not signed up? Tina, I'll go ahead and add your name. Thanks for joining us, Councilman Burns. All right. So we're going to give you two minutes just to please share your comments, and then we'll get into the agenda. First up, we have uh, Mr. Sebastian Nalls. Thank you, and good morning. It is a pleasure to be here in our first reparations committee meeting since the passage of the housing program. I wanted to take some time to touch on some points brought about by some of you at July 15th's ABC Town Hall meeting. Uh, thank you for creating the resource guide for black owned businesses and banks. Uh, it has been long been a critique of mine and other Evanston residents that it doesn't make sense to gridlock residents into using financial institutions that have predominantly hurt uh, people of color. Uh, so this is a good alternative, so thank you for that. Uh, second, I want to talk about the notion that $25,000 is not enough for a down payment on an entry level home in Evanston. Uh, did some research, I found a home at $190,000 to be charitable to that argument. Uh, with a down payment of $25,000 over a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, you're looking at about $15,500 per year. Uh, so with a median household income of $45,000 a year, that's simply not enough uh, for an Evanston resident uh, to be able to afford a home. Uh, and third is a statement that an overwhelming majority of community members that attended meetings did not want cash payments. I would love to see the data behind that because I think that's important that we bring that to light. Uh, and. Uh, because many uh, people believe that I complain without offering some solutions. I believe that the first step should be to survey black residents, go door to door if necessary, and I would be happy to help facilitate that in any way possible. There are a ton of volunteers that are here that would be willing to help out as well. Uh, I think we can get that done. Uh, next, I wanted to ask a point of clarity. Uh, Council Member Braithwaite uh, explained to myself and others uh, that we couldn't do cash payments because they would be taxable. Uh, however, would an IRS rules dictate that payments from this program would be taxed as well, especially on down payments? Or are we labeling this as a welfare program, therefore uh, circumnavigating those rules? So I just wanted a point of clarity on that issue. Uh, and then finally, I will touch base on uh, this last point. I would like to say, uh, if you want to serve on this committee and serve uh, this reparations movement as a whole, uh, we need to make sure that we're respecting others' opinions. I'm going to need opinions. you to uh, wrap it up. Gotcha. Uh, you know, Dr. Neighbor's notion that Dr. Darity's opinion on a reparations program should hold less value because he attended a predominantly white institution and subsequent and support of that to, statement. I'm going to ask you to wrap up by, your comments now. By, yep, by your council two minutes member. are up. Gotcha. Uh, it it makes us respectful. look dysfunctional, uh, and it's important that 
We all are inclusive during this entire process, and I'm more than happy to work with each and every one of you to make sure that we're making sure that we're understanding. Mr. Knowles, your opinions. time is now up. We're uh, going to ask for you to in this room. Thank wrap you so it up. Much. So in order to keep us on time, folks, I'm, I'm going to try to be respectful. I will give you a, a, just a heads up when there are 45 seconds, excuse me, 15 seconds left. And I'm just going to ask you to please be respectful of the process. That way we continue to get through the meeting in a timely fashion. All right, next up we have uh, Mr. Bennett Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for Good this morning, opportunity. Sir. Thank you for being here. Um, and also, greetings to the members of the committee, and I hope you do a great job. I uh, want to be clear. Uh, some over 20 years ago, uh, Dr. Heiser Taylor and a group had a conference on reparations. And it was very successful. Of course, the people who were on the council then didn't have the courage of a Robin Ruth Simmons and the people who voted for this particular program. <clears throat> so I think it's important to have a housing program because that's the center of wealth of any person in the United States. However, when we talk about reparations, we talk about repair. So you can't just limit it to housing. And I have presented what <clears throat> I call the Freedom Plan, which some of you may have, and it's been endorsed by many academicians and political leaders throughout the country. Basically, it has five parts. Real Estate Investment Trust for Housing, Venture Capital Group for uh, Business, uh, Education Fund, obviously, Health and Welfare, and then the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So, in my opinion, like Carlos indicated earlier, this is a great start. But unless we're comprehensive, and talk about real repair, all we've done is do a dance. And so I hopefully, at some point, I'll be able to make a presentation to this group as to specifics. The other important part is that it has to be independent. The money has to be independent of the electoral process. Part of, part of, part of, of course, the city council and people have to be involved, but the control has to be with the black community because it's supposed to be repair for the black community. Thank you very much. Hi, Bob. Thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Johnson. All right. Next we have uh, Ms. Renee Pitter. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, so I was born and raised in Evanston. And um, I left when I was 18 to pursue higher education. I've lived in and around Southeast Michigan ever since. Um, and social justice is the backbone of my education and career. Um, and so I pursued a career in public health. And so with that background, um, I've been thinking a lot about these issues. And I wanted to offer um, some thoughts and maybe some possible partnership <coughs> also with my um, association with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as a Culture of Health Fellow. So some of the things I've been thinking about is um, how will health outcomes be an integral part of the project from its inception? Um, as we know, in the recent COVID-19 pandemic has further illustrated, health and wellness is inextricably bound up in wealth creation, generation, and financial stability. Um, what measures will be used to measure health outcomes for reparation recipients? If participants um, receive compensation, do we expect them to have better overall health? And if so, how so? How will this affect individuals, their families, and the community? And how can reparations be used to support um, the clinicians and the education of future clinicians of color through educational pipelines? We know that there's a link between health outcomes and concordance between health providers and patients. Black physicians tend to treat individuals in more economically depressed and marginalized area than areas than their white counterparts overall statistically, um, despite the possibility of lower pay. So as you all begin the planning stages um, of the operations of this historic endeavor, um, a city near and dear to my heart and close to where I live, Detroit, has recently voted to add um, a reparations committee to their November ballot. And I hope 
that I can some way be involved in potential synergy between the two um, for, of my first and second home. So thank you all for your time. I know there's two minutes, so I tried to make it quick. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then our last speaker, give me a second to reset, is Ms. Tina Payton. Good morning, my name is Tina Payton. My family has been here for over 100 years in the same property. Uh, I've lived in my same house for 51 years. Um, so I am a long-term Evanston person. Also, um, I believe that uh, this meeting should be hybrid. There's a lot of seniors and people that are not able to attend the meeting in person or maybe out of town and um, they should have an opportunity, especially some of the uh, long-term residents here in Evanston are not able to physically get to the meeting. Also, um, I've been an advocate all the time for cash payment, and I'm still an advocate for cash payment. Um, we would like some answers also, and hopefully over these next few meetings we'll gain answers. We would like to know how much is in the reparations fund is very important. Uh, it is stated that uh, Evanston or that Illinois by the end of this year will make one billion dollars on weed sale tax. Uh, so it is very important that we know how much is in the fund at this time. Also uh, we should know where the money is being held and uh, what uh, interest or if it's in a bank that's important to, for us to know. Also, uh, who is selecting the applicants? I know that some of these uh, will be addressed today on the selection process. But it's very important that seniors are first in this matter because they are the ones that have been discriminated the most and they should be first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Payton. All right. So our, the, the following are items for discussion. I will review the Open uh, Meetings Act. We'll talk about item B is the implementation of the restorative housing program. Item C will be the restorative housing program guidelines, followed by, uh, followed by a couple of action items. And then we have uh, just some goal settings for our committee and then uh, communications report. You know, Kimberly, I'm gonna ask to move the item A under communications just to the top of the meeting. Uh, I think a couple of comments that we can quickly address. Uh, budget, where are we, your date, uh, the account, do you wanna handle that, Nick? The account where the funds are being handled? Just wanted to give a point of clarity to the committee and to the members of the public. There was a question about wanting to know how much is in the reparations fund. Um, under state law, we are not right. allowed to disclose how right. much tax revenue is generated from the single dispensary in Evanston. Mm -hmm. If there is an additional dispensary right. that opens in Evanston, we will be allowed to make that report. Right. However, since we have a single dispensary um, in Evanston, state law mandates that we not disclose that tax revenue. Okay. Um, so that, that's, a, that's an issue for Springfield, right? Um, but unfortunately we are not allowed to, to make that disclosure. And that, and that goes actually for even retailers such as big box stores. Like we have a single big box store, we can't necessarily report that tax revenue right. either. So I just wanna make Nick, that point. Thank you, Nick. And then he just explained the why. So I think part- Because it's single. <laughs> right, so part of what we will, will try to do, Nick, and I'll figure out, because. I recall the specific conversation of breaking down that monthly, you know, total, because then that would re represent what their overall gross is if somebody's doing the back math. But I think it may be an appropriate question if we look at what's total, because it would be difficult for somebody to discern like what their monthly bracket is so versus the total sum of what's in there. In the past, the dispensary has voluntarily Okay. reported their revenues and people have done the math. 
we as the city of Evanston cannot report Fair enough. tax revenue. Fair enough. So I'll connect with. So is everybody clear on that? Just I'm looking for an affirmation of head. Just if you have a business and they are a business, there's only one dispensary license that was issued in, in Evanston. That's, down, that's downtown in the second ward. So if you were to look at what the 6% represents, then we're now telling the public in the world what they're generating on a monthly basis. So we need to do one of two things. I'll reach out to the dispensary just to get an idea of where we are year to date, and they've been very cooperative in sharing that information. Um, but in terms of like the monthly dollar amount, as we protect all of our local businesses, they're no separate. Uh, they're not different than any other business. We're not going to report what their monthly dollar amount is. We hope, I've heard, you know, movement that the licenses are beginning to open up. Unfortunately, I haven't heard from any of our local Evanston residents who've submitted a license. But as soon as we get a second, a third, which we will hope within the next year or so, we'll be able to publish that, that information more freely. Thank you very much for your question, Mr. Payton. Chair, um, briefly, um, yeah. is that because is the argument that it puts them at a disadvantage against their competitors? I, I don't think I would frame that. I'm state, just I, wouldn't, to... I wouldn't frame it like that. But okay. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a state law. I'm not it, sure why it's that way, but the state mandates that if you have a single store, you know, entity, and it's the only one in your jurisdiction, that you have to keep confidential the tax revenues from that single entity, and that could be for competition. I, I really don't know, but that's a question for Springfield. Okay. All right. So let's all go ahead. All the members, I would yeah. like to add that we do uh, inform the committee of the donations and the yes. Yes. And so as of August, we have 25300 in the fund. Okay. And those dollars are currently being held in which line item? It's a donation line item in the reparations fund. So it's a 177. 177, okay. So moving forward, when we get to the budget season, they should be able to see that clearly in our, in our public documents. Thank you very much. In addition to that, and, and maybe now would be a good time to talk about that, uh, Ms. Simmons. So we've, we've always talked about a public and a private uh, partnership in, in doing so. And to, Mr. Johnson's point over the years of meeting, we've talked about a, re a reparation stakeholders authority, and that's going to be a group of, of residents here in Evanston comprised of our historically black uh, community organizations. And so I know that you've been working on that. We have Mr. Dino Robinson. And do we have a date set for that that we can share? No, I checked. Um there wasn't a date last I checked, but okay. to Mr. Johnson's point, um, the Everson Community Foundation believes so much in the work and expanding it to uh, meet comprehensive goals that they have seeded the uh, reparation fund at the foundation that will be managed and directed by uh, black members of the community. And more information will be available uh, from um, Reverend Dr. Neighbors. And, we'll, and we will uh, take care of that at a future meeting. So we're, we're short on time, so we're going to go ahead and jump right into the main meeting. Uh, did you talk about the Open Meetings Act? Do you want to go through that, sir? Thank you. Good morning again, Chair uh, Braithwaite, members of the committee, Nicholas Cummings, Corporation Council. Just very briefly uh, to inform some of you who are not familiar with the Open Meetings Act, this committee is an official committee of the city of Evanston, therefore it is a public body. Um, which means that all of your meetings, uh, official or unofficial, need to be public. Um, so that requires uh, each meeting has to have at least a quorum in order to be official. Uh, and a quorum for this body is four. Uh, a majority of that quorum is three. So any group or gathering of at least three of you is a meeting. Um, and so I would, and, and any communication between three or more of you is a meeting. So I just like you to keep that in mind so that any time um, you feel like you need to communicate with each other uh, or something like that, once you go over a certain threshold, it becomes a meeting and it needs to be open to the public and the public needs to be able to have access to that meeting. Um, it's up to you as a committee to sort of set rules that are in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Uh, on how you have public participation. So today's meeting is in person. There was a suggestion maybe it's hybrid. It's completely up to the committee on how 
that can run. However, your participation will, because of uh, state law, likely need to be in person. Uh, there are some exceptions when, if you cannot be here, that you may be able to participate remotely. However, um, it's up to you to set rules on, on how you want the public to, to be able to participate as well. Um, if you happen to have any questions regarding the Open Meetings Act, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but that's just a brief overview uh, at this point in time. Oh, yes. Also, um, because we are a public entity, we are subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Um, the things that you uh, do as a body are subject to FOIA. So if you are uh, communicating with each other um, within the meeting as the meeting is gathered or within, as I define to you, a majority of the quorum, those things, those communications may be subject to the uh, Freedom of Information Act here in Illinois. Okay. If you have any other questions, you, you can feel free to talk to me offline, though. Are there any quick, immediate questions before we move forward? Everybody's clear on that? Clear. Good. All right. Our next item is item B, which is implementation of the calendar of the restorative housing program. Our staff recommends the reparations committee to review and provide feedback regarding the implementation of our calendar for the restorative housing program, which includes community workshops, educating community members, interested in applying for the program and this items for discussion and starts on page three yes Ready? hi good um, again so um over the last few months staff has been working um trying to figure out the implementation of the program to ensure that it's transparent and fair uh, we have um, a number of partnerships that we've begun to develop to help with executing the application process one being our public library, uh, and more to come with that. What we're trying to do, um, trying to determine today with the committee um, direction is just how to begin the process of education, because as we discussed via the previous iteration of the committee, that we wanted to have some form of education around the application process so that individuals had an opportunity to understand what information they needed to provide and that those who may not have access to the online portal would be able to utilize um, some type of assistance to um, uh, fill out that documentation. The documentation would be on, will be an online document only because just one, we've been working with our IT department for quite some time um, to ensure the security of the documents, to ensure the security of the site. Um, just because of the sensitivity of information being asked, we want to ensure that individuals felt that their information was safe and secure, um, which it is um, going to be. Uh, so we did not want to have any um, paper documentation that could then become um, you know, another st step we would have to figure out security for. Um, secondly, we want to discuss workshops. So we are looking at having a number of virtual workshops and also there might be um, individual groups who might be inviting staff and others to come and participate in just wanting to provide the overview of the application, the overview of the process. And so what we would like to do is identify committee members as ambassadors as part of this process that we will then um, invite you into the training that we will be having with staff as we begin to build our team to help with the implementation. This is all going to begin to occur um, in the uh, after August 23rd, recognizing that a number of our staff members are needing to take a well-deserved vacation. Um, and so that was the time that we knew we would be able to fully staff and have um, some additional support. Uh, so far, it's been a, a two-person team, myself and Tashik, which has been great for them, uh, just on behind the scenes, been working fine. But we realized that as this began to roll out, we need to be a little bit more of a, a robust uh, process. So. Um, between August 23rd through September 17th, we're looking at doing those workshops with the community um, and interested groups who might want to be a part of this. Uh, but then Tuesday, September 21st is the launch date of the online application. Um, so we will be prepared to uh, have that announced. Um, people will be informed of when that's going to happen, where the site, everything will be a part of the education process that will be occurring prior to the to 21st. So our normal communication, but also uh, other communications that we may discover that we need to um, utilize. 
We are looking at a 30 day window for the application for the first part, just to, one, just to ensure that we have adequate time to review applicants. Um, as we stated in the, out, um, as stated in the guidelines, uh, the applications are going to be open to all, but first is going to be uh, tiered to those who are qualified as ancestors. Those are the individuals who have lived in Evanston and were directly harmed by the policies that were implemented. So those individuals will have first review of, of the funding. Uh, it's going to come back to the committee. So once we verify as staff that everyone has their documentation, staff does not qualify individuals. It's the committee's responsibility. What we will do is put everyone's information together, kind of like a, some type of booklet where we will have application just to show that everyone has met the qualifications. This way, we're not passing documents that could be uh, sensitive to the committee. Uh, we will have some type of a form that we will fill out as staff to say that they've completed the document and met the qualifications as specified. And then it will be to the committee's uh, discretion how to move forward. And then the disbursement of funds will happen as well soon after. So the hope is by November, we will have our first funds dispersed to the community members. Any Thank questions? You. Concerns? Questions or comments? I have some. Please. Um, thank you for getting this part done um, over the summer. This is, this is the difficult work. Um, just as it relates to community engagement and outreach and support, uh, we talked about and had a um, agreement from NAACP supporting in uh, helping residents with their application if there's a need. They have an office at Family Focus Building. And I'm just thinking now, Evanston Own It should probably be uh, a partner to consider, if only for education and outreach because mm -hmm. of the community that they serve. Um, and then we also talked about having um, info sessions similar to what we did for COVID, uh, that series. Okay. Uh, just sharing the information. The videos you'll be speaking to? The videos. Okay. Um, and I believe they were live. And they were. Yeah. Facebook live videos. Yeah, the Facebook live videos. I think that was good. And also, um, you know, we would need to have something COVID safe and in person as well to make sure okay. that we're accommodating everyone's preference of um, engagement. Okay. And um, just thinking about any other community groups, you know, I think the committee should come up with a list of organizations that reach our uh, black sure. community, um, the cricket club and, um, you know, the list goes on, the, the Greek organizations mm -hmm. and so on. And so maybe we can think together about a list to share with staff so that they are getting that information. And those organizations could be among the first invited to this uh, training, workshop, ambassador sort of piece. Yes. Um, I think that's all that I have. That's great information. So what we will do once we start getting that information, we'll create a Google sheet so that everyone can see who um, the individual or organiz special organizations are and then contact information would be helpful. And that, that's a great suggestion that we need to incorporate those community partners in. Thank you. Next, uh, I think I'll recognize Ms. Claire McFarland Barber, followed by Bonnie Lockhart. Sure. Yeah, picking up on um, what uh, what was just said about educate outreach and educating the community, I also would like to suggest that we think about not only the workshops for the, disseminating the information about the application, but having some in-person assistance available that specifically targets seniors, our ancestor group is so very important. Yes. And it's my experience that even though we're Zooming and teaming and we're used to that, there are many older people who are uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And then they're particularly uncomfortable when we talk about putting some personal information onto a computer. Mm -hmm. So if we can think about getting some system in place where they, they could come somewhere if they don't have a computer internet or they could have some someone that uh, some some volunteers I don't know what yeah you know, we'd yes. have to think yes. about that um, but some people who could just sit with them and help them to make sure that that group is not excluded simply because you know they just found it overwhelming to participate in the application process sure. Yes. And I think just to respond to that, at the top of that list should be our Foster Seniors Club. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. 
the most wealthy, I mean, just in terms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Sutton. Uh, oh, it's fine. It's, it's, okay, it's good. Yeah. No, is somebody's phone on? It's, it's, it's all right. Yeah, it'll stop. You might want to show them how to put it on <laughs> vibrate. Stop. Oh, you, you've experienced this before. Yeah. And, and so the reason that I call out our foster senior group, uh, just, I, I mean, I can't say enough about them, but what I will say is that they have, they represent, you know, that golden age group, and they have bridged that technology gap. Mm -hmm. They do monthly meetings online, Zoom meetings, bingo online that I've attended. So we will add them to the list of groups to help with the outreach, mm -hmm. seeing that they are our target population. Ms. Lockhart, you yeah. had a comment? Yeah, I have a comment and a question. Yes. First, I want to echo what um, both Robin and Claire have said about our elderly, our elders, and the importance of having something in person. I also want to acknowledge um, Ms. Garrison saying how important it is that we make sure they get the information. Um, and the fact that IT is everywhere, but that population is not comfortable with it, and that we must have in-person workshops. And so my question is, what is the amount of workshops that you all have considered having, and have you thought about doing them around the city? So to that point, um, the actual uh, application, I mean, working with the library, they were going to be our in-person support staff mm -hmm. uh, to help with individuals wanting to come in and work with um, accessing the document. Uh, so we have been thinking about ensuring that we have some type of in-person process. It's just a matter of we didn't want to have two different processes happen where we had just collecting paper documents and then you have an online process. So our goal is to beef up the uh, support with that regard. So the Foster Senior Club is a great example of how that could be a good partner. To your question, um, workshops. We had minimum of four, but we know there's going to be more, and that's why we gave such a breath of, of time. Okay. Um, now, if we have more community partners, that can be over a dozen that we can do. But as for staff, I, you know, I, I didn't want to overcommit us, and then we didn't hit that target. But initially, we said we can at least try for four, and then the goal was to identify um, ambassadors who would be able to provide additional support. But we wanted to ensure that they were trained and understood the document and the process as well, so we were having the same conversations. Um, but as to the in-person, um, we will definitely uh, make that arrangement. We just wasn't sure with what's going on in the world. You know, sure. every time we seem to think COVID. we're going forward, we take a step. <laughs> backwards, but right. we will definitely incorporate that into the schedule um, as, you know, we even think about our, our faith community uh, as being a good hub for some of these meetings. Um, it does not, my goal is not to have meetings in the Civic Center. Mm -hmm. It is to have meetings outside the community if you're going to meet in person. Thank Perfect. you. All right, so to keep us moving forward and seeing no additional comments, the summary dates uh, that we're using for targets, it's on page three of your packet is, Monday, August 23rd through Friday, September 17th. Those are going to be our virtual workshops on the application process. Tuesday, September 21st is going to be the online application release. Tuesday, September 21st. And then on uh, Thursday, October 21st is the application deadline. I'd like to suggest to members of our community that we extend that. I think, Kimberly, I, I appreciate the moving forward, and I want to make it at least 45 days, and that way we were making sure that we're doing our proper like outreach. That's idea. a lot of, mm -hmm. that's a real condensed mm -hmm. time to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to get it out. And, and I definitely want to get this moving, mm -hmm. but I don't want to, to miss okay. anyone. And I think it's important to note that, again, this is just our first 4% of the budget of a $10 million effort that doesn't include our donations and it doesn't include the dollars that are going to be raised to the Evanston Community Foundation. So I want to say it again, this is our first of 4% of a $10 million priority budget initiative for our black community. So we have plenty of time to expand on this and entertain and explore other other ideas. Um, I would, um, just a to understand you're looking to push back or to extend the application 
window for to 45 days from 30 that days? Is, that mm -hmm. is correct. Okay, and where does that put us on the um, review by calendar in terms of getting disbursement <laughs> it, out? I mean, if 15 more days um, in terms of the intensity of the workshops, the outreach, it's the first 4%. There is, you know, space for, a, you know, a limited amount of applications to be approved. Um, can you, Kimberly, can you tell us where that would put us on the calendar? Well, I said November. I didn't give a date. So, I mean, right. we need to have a special meeting to the committee so that you can approve the first set of, of applicants. We can do that. Um, I don't think that pushing out 15 days will change the November timeline. It's just going to make us have to be more efficient in on the internal part of the process. So we will meet whatever deadline you all set um, so I, we can keep with the November. And if we see that there's something we will uh, that may change that, we will communicate that to the committee immediately. OK. Any other questions? Mr. Yeah, I have two okay. concerns. Okay. Uh, one, uh, when you start this application process, uh, and especially for elderly people, will there be an uh, opportunity for them to have a paper <coughs> trail of their own? And secondly, how can we find access to where these sites will be? Will that information be available on 311 where Correct. people could call to find out where these meetings will be? Great yeah, question. so these, we're going to blitz the heck out of this process. So, um, you know, my goal is that we're not just going to use our normal channel of communications from the city perspective. We're going to need the support of the committee and the community members even present today uh, as we get the word out. And, you know, we have been very uh, robust uh, listserv of individuals who have been signed up and we have over 400, maybe even close to 500 members of that listserv. So we have a lot of community support of wanting to get information out. Uh, but I look to you all to give us some, some additional um, input because we will not you know, just say we're just doing X, Y, and Z. I think we need to be creative in how we are communicating this. To your point regarding the application, um, yeah, so if someone, just similar to a person receiving it electronically, an um, individual, even if they come in and have someone work, the, work with them to submit the application, they will get a paper copy of that application. And they will have, in that, it will also show confirmation that the application was submitted. Mm -hmm. So all that will continue to happen, even if it's a person submitted, when they're doing it in person with someone um, uploading the documentation for them online. Thank you. Uh, D Deputy Manager, you said you mentioned that the ancestors would be, I, I can't recall the words you used, prioritized, preference. I just wanted to better understand that. How sure. would that work? So as is stated in the guidelines, the ancestor, which is the population that actually lived in Evanston between the time frame, uh, are the first prioritized individuals. The second would be those who are direct descendants. And then the third are those individuals who may not qualify for either of those two categories, but may have sh be able to prove harm um, via housing um, after, 19, um, after 1969. And so the conversation that we had previously with the other committee was we wanted to ensure that our senior populations were given first priority. And so again, that is the, the direction that we decided to move in as the commission, committee. However, I would really encourage everyone to review the guidelines because there's other information that you may need to know um, that is spelled out with the application process. Uh, we still have $400,000 being funded for this program. So we do have the $400,000 ready to go to be dispersed. So that's no question of that funding. It is available, it's ready, um, and it's allocated in the budget. Uh, so, you know, as this, as we see what the uh, responses are with uh, qualified individuals, that'll be a conversation to come back to the committee about that budget and amount. And, and that was more so for the audience that if there's, the way I'm understanding this, if there's 16 ancestors who apply and we have right now, it feels like, you know, 16 available benefits to give out that they will be prioritized for those 16. That is um, correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that. Yes. Th okay. th thank you very much. Right. And, thank you. Um, our hope is that we come back to you say, you know what, this program is so successful, we, we may want to up the budget. Um, so that's something to consider. 
uh, and I also want to be clear to the committee, since this is the first time we had this conversation, is that it's up to 25000 and it's over three different programs. So if right. individuals do not uh, decide that they just wanted to fix their roof, and this funding is there to fix a roof, and if the roof is only 15000 and they decide that they do not want to utilize the other funding, it will be able to go back in the pot, but it will be at the discretion of the community member as they go through the process if they want to use that 20, full 25000 So, Thank you. So I want to keep us moving. We cover the first section, which is the, the summary of the date. So again, uh, we'll repeat and then we'll move on. Monday, the 20th, August 23rd through September 17th is going to be our virtual workshops. We'll expand that to include in person. We've given you a, a, a nice yeah. robust list of organizations to work with to get the word out. Uh, September 21st through, let's just say August 30th, will will be October. the excuse me October, <laughs> October. That's okay. 31st will be the application deadline date, and then we should be able to start with the disbursement sometime in November. Correct. 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 All right. Awesome. Is everyone good with that? We'll move yes. over to the next item. Mm -hmm. Next is item for discussion is uh, item number C. It's the review the rest, excuse me, restorative housing program guidelines. Uh, the memos on page four. Uh, our staff is recommending that our reparations committee review the adopted local reparation uh, restorative housing program guidelines. Uh, that this is currently budgeted for four hundred thousand dollars, and that represents the dollars that we have collected thus far. Again, we have a goal of hitting ten million, so that's four percent. And that funds will uh, be provided in our fund 177.15.1595.62490 for those, again, that ask where's the money being held. Uh, the summary of the program, do you want to go ahead and give it to us sure. high level? I'll and then be we'll very quick, and I really just wanted to just put this in this packet because this is the new committee, and I think yep. it's just for the historical <coughs> reference. Uh, but again, the program consists of three programs within the initiative, the home ownership home improvement and mortgage assistance. And within that, the way that the program is funded, we fund directly to, the, to either the financial institution or the uh, vendor, vendor uh, construction company um, in a way to avoid having uh, individual be penalized taxable income given to them directly from the city. So how this will work is that we will um, we're still working through that process of how uh, that part of that's going to work with regards to the um, home improvement benefit, uh, but we're almost close to having some direction to give to, see, uh, to the committee. Uh, however, um, the way that the participants are identified is through three criteria, either ancestor, direct descendant, or as I said earlier, an individual who experienced housing discrimination due to the city's policies or practice after 1969. Uh, again, I'm just reiterating what we've said. Um, the initial applications will be accepted, reviewed, and funded in the following order. Ap applicants applying as ancestors, applicants applying as direct descendants, and then applicants applying as direct um, harm due to the housing discrimination. Um, other than that, I think uh, pretty much the committee will be the um, individuals reviewing uh, the qualified applicants and then the funds, once you qualified, uh, once you state qualifications have been met, then we will, as, uh, as the administrator of the, of the program staff, will then contact the individuals, um, letting them know that their application was approved and the funding has been allocated for their um, use. Um, and everything will be done in writing, so they will receive a letter um, informing them of that um, as well. So we would like to probably send them out a letter as well as an email just to have two tracks, but we want to ensure that anyone who submitted the application will receive some form of communication thanking them for applying, if they have been um, able to move forward, or if they weren't, you know, thank you for applying, however, um, your application. Need, may need some additional s review, and that's something we can discuss as well about those applicants that um, did not, were not able to um, move forward, but may have some concerns. So I think we need to address that at some point as a committee, but we'll have to first see what the responses look like. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for the committee? I'll recognize. Uh, 
yeah. Ms. Barber, and then Mr. Sutton. Thank you. Um, my question is, once the appli applicants, applications have been accepted um, and we find eligible people and, and we simply have, you know, we simply run out of funds in this phase, once the phase is opened up again, do those applications automatically roll over or do, will people, I, I, I just anticipating questions yes. from the community, question. will the people, those applicants have to apply again in some way refresh their application or do those just automatically roll over into a next phase that may come up in the future? So we discussed that actually and what we stated was that those applicants are in the queue. So as soon as funding is made available, those applicants will be the next in line to receive funding. So once we, we would, we, I would recommend it is the committee's, it's going to have to be the committee's direction that we do not open up another application until we are able to satisfy the applicants that did submit and were approved. Um, just because I think the process in itself is, is going to take some time and I think I want to, it's important to honor those individuals taking that extra time to fill out this information. So I would recommend that we just go through that list and exhaust that list before we open it back up for another phase of applicants. Thank you. Mr. Sutton, you had a question or comment? Well, when we were prioritizing uh, recipients, uh, I'm a little concerned that um, uh, A and uh, C uh, probably will not be appropriate at this time. Uh, very few elderly people have a mortgage, but they do need assistance. And the uh, direct uh, payment to a vendor, uh, I'm very concerned that these vendors will be ones that are qualified for the city to uh, require building permits and things like that. So uh, with uh, the money to be distributed, that's just my view at this time. If your priority is the elderly, okay, and you're only going to be able to reach 16 uh, 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 distributions, that um, maybe we ought to just uh, redo the category of who uh, the first people to receive assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And so, Kim, I'm, I'm looking at you and, and also Nick, I think in anticipation of this rolling out so quickly, uh, I'll say my, you know, expectation is that we will be able to highlight these individuals. And so as part of the application process, can we consider a little check the box? I, I can't think of the language right now that means we'll be able to, if they so choose, use their picture, use their name if they feel comfortable about it. But at some point, you know, I, I think we're going to be looking at partnering with, with a not-for-profit. So are, is their name, is there an opportunity for them to be anonymous, I guess would be the best way to ask it. Well, that's a good question I'll, we have to discuss. I think for right now, we'll take that comment and Nick and I need to discuss further. We are a public entity, yep. so there are certain things that one who is in a non-profit or, or a private entity have a little bit more cover, but let Nick and I discuss and we will come back to the committee with that information. Yeah. I mean, I would want to be able to talk about these individuals in the most responsible way. Sure. So we should. And I think, think there might be individuals we will have to directly ask them separately of once they are approved that they'd be willing to share their story. Uh, but I want to be clear, like, I, I want to be clear that that does not hinder anyone from Correct. participating in the program if they choose not to identify themselves publicly. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Did you have? All right. Are there any other questions under the program guidelines? And again, I'm going to encourage members of the public, all this information that we're discussing and that we're moving forward with is on our City of Evanston's reps website. Um, you would have to go to the committee. Oh, sorry, Alright. Yes. I want to jump in on the guidelines. And I know we have um, we left off the last committee on development of this um, resource guide. And um, is that complete or no? 
And if not, that's great because we got a whole new committee here. So, okay, got it. So, okay. so we have some work to do, and the community. This is where we can all participate. Mm -hmm. So, our goal is to uh, provide a directory of our black. Uh, residential contractors, all trades, mm -hmm. our black realtors, our black uh, uh, attorneys that do closings, anyone that's touching a real estate transaction, mm -hmm. uh, we want to provide a really complete directory. There's some here and there. Bennett has a list. You know, the, the um, consortium has a list. But if you could get in touch with, um, is there a one central email? Yes. So, okay. Reparations at CMP. Reparations at Yes, yeah, so if you are a black business or know a black business or can share information, Sebastian, that would be really helpful if you could help us with doing that and building out this directory so that there is a value add to the reparation benefits that are going out in potentially $25,000 in business revenue to a black contractor or a new you know, um, closing commission for a realtor or so on. <laughs> Uh, we're also committed to providing a list of black banks. We know we don't have hit any here in town. I believe there's one in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It's questionable if it is black anymore. But we're going to provide that. And um, if you have any information about black um, banks or lending or anything like that, please do send it to that email address so that we can provide that and have it ready when we start these workshops. Sarah, I think I see Sarah Flax in the back. Do you have? We'll, we'll meet after this, and I want to get our list that we use during NSP2, and then we'll take a glance at that and figure out how many businesses are still, are still uh, open. All right. So we're, we're, as we close out our meeting, we are at uh, item D, which is our, our goal setting. I, I want to open this up to, to, to the committee just to share some additional thoughts. We've just completed. Um, our first our first remedy I, I mentioned at the top of the meeting you, you will continue to hear this that this, this represents the first four percent of dollars that we have accumulated so the money for this comes from the sales tax revenue so we can't budget and spend money that we don't have and then I hope between now and the next committee meeting we'll be able to project out what that next dollar amount will look like you know look Probably will I'll ask them to project out to mid July of next year, 2022. But now I just I'm interested in opening this up for discussion, uh, for any thoughts that the committee members have, and we'll start with Bonnie and quickly go around, and then we'll adjourn our meeting. Feedback or comments? <clears throat> well, I'm just um, curious about August 23rd is really very much close and um, how we plan to prepare for that as a committee with the dates being solidified and um, time frame. Oh, that's a question. That's a goal, <laughs> that's a question. question. That's a question. I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, it does seem like it's a tight time, but we're, again, that's the starting time. Mm -hmm. That is not like one done. Mm -hmm. But I guess my real question is, yeah. do we, will we be getting information specifically as to what dates, yes. times prior to August 23rd. I don't know that we would be having a meeting, but if can you give us an idea of when we might be able to look for that? Yes, you should have a probably by, I would, I would tell you it will be Monday. Okay. Like how, I mean, seriously, we've okay. been working on it so long that mm -hmm. it's just a matter of us okay. not trying to be perfectionists and just okay. saying what like, uh, <laughs> Great. trying to stop being um, and I, I just want to say, I think this meeting was a great beginning to provide quite a bit of information. I can see the amount of work that you all have done. I, I do think there are a lot of questions in the community still about what this is and what this looks like. And so the sooner we can provide um, information and the window to when that information is available, I think would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Just, just piggybacking on, on what you said, Bonnie, I think it's not the community. I think it's like nationally and internationally questions are coming up about mm -hmm. how this process is unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my question is, once we identify some community groups that are appropriate to assist in the virtual workshops or perhaps in, uh, host an in-person one or 
something of that nature. What is the process? Where do we direct them? Do we direct them to contact you directly? Should, do, should they contact you, Mr. Braithwaite? Like, what? What is the yeah. procedure for, uh, off, you know, putting them in somebody's hands to get them involved and to incorporate them into the outreach Questions. process? Mm -hmm. So I would rec well to make it more efficient. What we will do today is create a Google sheet. We will send it to everyone who's a member. If you don't understand Google, it allows for us to real-time incorporate information. Mm -hmm. So it will be a spreadsheet that you can provide the name, contact information, and then we will have a checklist to say we've been in contact with them. We, you know, we will have it so that way everyone knows where everyone's been queued into the process of, of uh, <coughs> outreach. And then that way, also, you're not sending us the same information. We may be two different mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So to make this more efficient from our standpoint, it will be very helpful for us to kind of coordinate this with you all. Using Google Sheets is the best way to do that. And then you just pop in the person's name. We will check it daily, and then we will reach out to them immediately once we, you know, every day pretty much until we have a good, robust list. And then what we will do is create a schedule as well, and that schedule could be, you know, certain dates, but just realize if we have new dates and times, we're going to just incorporate it into the schedule, and if you want to participate, then we can discuss that participation. I would appreciate at least having one member of the committee as part of these virtual or in-person meetings just so that we have you all are really the ambassadors here, here to support you all in that way. Um, and so that part, I would like to get that next, that's what you're going to get next week. It's like here are the meetings that we are scheduling as staff that we would like you all to be a part of. And then if you have additional meetings, then we can always throw those into the mix. And then we will continue to update the community as those dates come about. We realize that a lot of times it's like the first couple meetings people may have heard about it. Mm -hmm. It's usually the that intel in where you need to have these meetings. Now I may even say we are going to probably still have meetings during the process of the applications being open mm -hmm. because people are going to not know about it and then they're going to hear from mm -hmm. community members. So I don't want to say this time frame is like locked can't do anything beyond that. This is just giving us a framework so that we can hold ourselves as staff accountable to mm -hmm. these dates. <clears throat> and someone had mentioned earlier, and I'm sorry, I don't know if you were finished, oh. but that is there a way that 311 can be involved? I think that, you know, with all due respect, Google Workshop sounds great for the committee, but for the citizens and for people who might want to just make a phone call to say what's happening or where is it happening, I mean, 311 is amazing. I mean, I use it a lot. So is there any possibility that we might be able to take advantage of that with just the dates and the information that's going to be available for things? I'm sorry, I was understood. I thought we were talking about the committee communication, not the community. No, the workshops. The workshops always 311 is given information. Okay. So okay. 311 is kind of our hub. Okay. So when people call, so typically what happens I didn't someone know that. <laughs> calls about reparations, 311 would send an email to myself or to she to say this person called, they had questions that they couldn't answer. Okay. But all information regarding dates are given to all of our communication hubs, which includes okay. 311. Uh, the library Great. will have that information, and as well as other departments that in, engage and interact with the community, so Healthy Human Services as awesome. well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sutton? Yeah, uh, I just want to follow up on that. I want to make sure that this process is one of inclusiveness throughout the community. But more important, we need to establish a sense of trust in this community. And the more open it is, the next thing I would like to know, if any group is identified, could the members of this committee be uh, contacted so we could go and have a representative of wherever these groups are meeting throughout the city? I think it's important that we stay involved with the community directly. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's uh, uh, pretty fair that no one should feel that their application will not be considered or uh, addressed properly. Mm -hmm. So if there's a member from the committee and a group in the community, uh, I would love to, me personally, to be informed if anybody would like to have information on this, that we are available to go speak to them what we are allowed to do at this point. But that's a lot of questions. What are you going to do and when are you going to do it? And uh, 301 is a start. But I think a personal representative to some of these groups is very important. Yeah, I would, I would um, 
expect that there would not be a meeting without at least a committee member. So mm -hmm. that's the expectation of, I think we all have that mm -hmm. expectation mm -hmm. that staff is providing support, but we are appointed okay. to represent mm -hmm. the community. Um, so we'll make sure that we're, we're present for that. And, and one other thing, is it possible that we could set the process where this could be a hybrid meeting uh, on Zoom from the yeah, we we we've, we've discussed that we're gonna we're gonna work towards that. Uh, Corporation Council. I just wanted to point out that um, while the committee is liaising with the community, um, should more than two of you show oh, up to this yeah. meeting, right. and you're discussing the city's reparations program at this meeting, it becomes a public meeting, and we could become. Uh, uh, we get in some trouble with the attorney general because it was not properly noticed and didn't follow me. So I just want to, I'm not discouraging you from being ambassadors. Just be mindful. Just be mindful that, yeah. you know, four of you show up and yeah. you start talking about this program, it could be problematic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. So just just as, as a matter of practice, if we do decide to get, what, what is the notice that needs to be given? What's the procedure? Who, do, who does that flow through if we if we somehow trigger that public meeting uh, threshold? It needs to be done 48 hours in advance. Mm -hmm. um, we need to, and it needs to be told the, the, the usual time right. and place and location of that meeting, um, which, you know, because of COVID has been fungible lately, but usually it's here. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about having meetings in the community, that's a lot different. Mm -hmm. And that, that meeting notice usually funnels through city staff so yeah. we would have to be aware of those meetings as well so I would just more so recommend yeah. that the committee Limited. members coordinate amongst yeah. yourselves mm -hmm. sure. and say yeah. I'm going to go to this meeting or right. I'm going to go to this meeting right. so that we're not true, all of you don't show right. up right we're not having meeting. that problem okay. <laughs> can I just jump in and, here mm -hmm. um, yeah and I think that needs to be issue. clearly so, the, mm -hmm. and again so members of public if they see the three of us out together they're not concerned <laughs> So if there's a specific meeting on the topic of reparations, we will be out in the community a number of times and you will see all of us standing in one place. So I don't want people to misinterpret what, what you're saying, Nick. Mm -hmm. If there is a meeting that's held specifically to discuss our Evanston local reparations program, unless we notice it on our city calendar, the expectation is there's only going to be two, two of us present. So if you don't see me, if you don't see mm -hmm. Ms. Simmons, mm -hmm. Councilmember Burns, or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be, it is because of that, right? And we'll be sure that if we're ever in that setting, that as committee members, I would hope that you would explain that mm -hmm. at the top of the meeting, in the middle of the meeting, and at the end of the <laughs> meeting, right? So yeah. we'll, and again, these are for our smaller organizations with a right. more targeted approach to getting the message out. We'll still continue to have our large group meetings in session you wanted to I say do, something because i think this is getting really compli more complicated and um and alarming <laughs> than it <laughs> needs to be um kimberly usually we have in a new season we have a uh, a calendar of our meetings can we have that mm -hmm. for yeah. our so we're going to determine what that meeting schedule for this committee meeting is yeah that is what i'm uh, getting clear direction from you all mm -hmm. that that's a committee meeting as to these outreach meetings, like if we are scheduling from the city perspective, you will be programmed. So it's going to say right. these, these are the two people mm -hmm. are going right. to this meeting. Right. I trust on our end, mm -hmm. we're kind of like your handlers. We will give you the schedule. <laughs> you tell right. us if you can make it, and then we will make sure that you're fine. If you have kids out in the community, we can't control that. That's another thing. But for this committee, we just need to know what the set date and time of this meeting is going right. to be. Mm -hmm. That will be published uh, as soon as you all agree to that. Right, so, so if it's going to be a standing meeting, mm -hmm. it's going to be, what is today, Thursday, 9 o'clock? That's correct. That's going to be our meeting schedule for the rest of this term. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then these community meetings are going to be very well organized. So mm -hmm. that just to set the right expectation for staff, we don't have to go and staff a meeting, no. you no. know, print flyers, any of that. <laughs> we have a brilliant executive staff mm -hmm. that we will direct to do that work, and they will do much better than we can do it. Mm -hmm. And so we'll give them the names of the organizations and leaders that we want to maybe participate, convene, mm -hmm. host. They will do the outreach to them. 
and then they handle us so well they'll say hey Rob and Bonnie and Claire mm -hmm. you all can't all be there you know two of you right is that right that's correct. yeah that's perfect have, just to yeah, take some I of the burden get, off yeah right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right we can continue to move on so again just in terms of of goal setting exercise I'm, I'm really excited that we're at this point very close to mm -hmm. uh, you know being able to pay out our, our first payment mm -hmm. and, and and I think it's important because there's some and again housing down payment mortgage assistance as well as like home repairs, mm -hmm. all of those are out of the housing. So it is not just limited to the first time home, home buyers that we continue to hear in, mm -hmm. in our community. So one of the things that I would love for our committee members to think about between now and our next meeting is what are gonna be our next steps? How are we gonna expand on the, the funding mm -hmm. opportunity? I'm a big fan of economic development. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of a better time to start a black business coming out of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. We have $5.5 million that we have allocated from the ARPA funds, the federal dollars coming in. Mm -hmm. So give some thought to that okay. as, our, as, as one of our next steps. And then meanwhile, uh, Dino, I think you're still with us. Uh, I'm gonna challenge you for our next meeting to, to have dates available for our reparation stakeholders group to meet. You, I see your hand raised, you got it, yeah. cool. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get that started as well. Can I just be clear that this reparation stakeholder authority is not an associated group with the city? Correct. Okay, so I just wanted to, because I think that was some confusion that this was a city committee that's a subcommittee no. of the no. city. This is separate from the city. Dino, do you mind coming to the podium, please? As we wrap up, this is probably our last <laughs> bullet point. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is just explain the thought process behind that. I think it speaks directly to Mr. Johnson's comments earlier during public comment. Thank sure, you. again for the record, my name is Dino Robinson, founder of the Shorefront Legacy Center. And uh, this conversation kind of came about um, about a year and a half ago um, when the first distributions of money from the city uh, was being uh, considered. And there were a lot of comments from the community that this, um, about, what about, a, what about funds that are not as heavily restricted? So that led to a thought process where, where can we, who can we partner with to uh, generate funds that will be the benefit to uh, the reparations initiatives outside of the city of Evanston's um, purview. Uh, there was a partnership with uh, Evanston Community Foundation. They stepped up and started allocating some seed money. And during this process, and we're still in this process to this day, we're working on getting a nonprofit status for uh, the RSAE. That application is almost complete. And we anticipate having public meetings very soon. Um, the core, and we're still looking for board members, the core board members are deriving from historically black organizations, black clubs, and, 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 and citizens of Evanston, black citizens of Evanston, for the purposes of managing the funds at the Evanston Community Foundation as the funds are raised that can work in conjunction with any type of reparations program that the community itself designates how that will operate. So I think that's the best way I could sum it no, up at this point. You, you did a real good job and then we'll continue to have updates and reports while we have this meeting. Correct, and Thank I hope you know with next meeting I can bring really good news to say that we are a 501c3. Uh, there's a meeting and election of board members um, yes. and, and and officers. So that's our goal. So Thank we you. can really get moving. Uh, the community can get really moving on addressing issues that are near and dear to them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for being a part of the process. Okay. All right. So that brings us uh, to the end of the meeting. We already had our. Reparations financial donation report. We, we covered that at the top of the meeting. Are there any last comments before we adjourn? Sure, I'll just jump in. Uh, reparations is, uh, is, is happening nationally, and we're doing our part as the city of Evanston for the specific actions of the city of Evanston. And it's important to note that uh, whatever program we do here will not be alone enough to get us to full repair uh, as black people. And it's important to note that in 2002, our city supported 
HR 40 by resolution. It was led by um, Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste. Um, and that HR 40 is advancing, uh, having a historic vote. I don't know if Cam Howard left or not, if he's still here. He's there. Um, mm -hmm. Cam is, is, do you want to give an update on HR 40 or should I just quickly? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, HR 40 now, uh, <coughs> since 2019, there were around 50 or 60 co-sponsors in the house. Today, there are 192 co-sponsors mm. in the House, including our representatives, uh, Congresswoman Joukowsky and Senator uh, Durbin and Duckworth, uh, our co-sponsors on the Senate Companion Bill S-40. Um, there's a lot of movement and a lot of momentum. Mm. There's also was an introduction at the state level. I don't know where that is. But as we are um, becoming very much committed to reparations and advocating for it, you also can advocate at the state of Illinois and also uh, federally uh, with HR 40 because all of that will be needed for us to uh, recover from the harms done to us in this nation. Thank you. All right. So again, to the members of the public, I want to thank you all for coming out and being part of this process. We appreciate your time as well as your comments. I want to also thank our staff for all the hard work between uh, the last time we met and, and what we've been able to present today, as well to the members of our community, Ms. Lockhart, Ms. McFarland Barber, uh, Mr. Carlos Sutton, our Honorable Ms. Robin Simmons, and of course, Councilman uh, Burns. Uh, we have so much work to begin, and I'm really excited to do that. So bless you all for coming out. We look forward to seeing you at the next committee meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. I second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Did you have a last comment? All right. All those in favor, seeing that there's aye, aye. our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.